Welcome to Capsule RN, where nursing school just got easier. Meet Sally, a 32-year-old patient at the urgent care complaining of left rib pain. Sally states she got in a minor fender bender about two hours ago. The vital signs the nurse took at the beginning of Sally's visit were a temperature of 98.2, a pulse of 76, respirations of 20, blood pressure of 130 over 82, SpO2 of 99%, and a pain level of 3 out of 10. It should also be noted that the x-ray the doctor took showed no rib fractures. Based on Sally's story and current vital signs, what drug treatment will the doctor likely prescribe Sally? Is the answer A, oxycodone, B, gabapentin, C, ibuprofen, or D, ice and heat? To answer this question correctly, we first need to understand some things about pain and how it is treated. So let's get started. What is pain? There can be many definitions of pain, but to keep it simple, as it relates most often in nursing, pain is an unpleasant feeling caused by tissue or nerve damage. Pain is known as a vital sign because it should be checked regularly just like temperature, pulse, respirations, blood pressure, and oxygen saturation. We classify pain in two broad categories, acute and chronic pain. Acute pain is short-term pain that alerts us to a problem or injury. An example of acute pain would be a headache experienced with the flu or surgery site pain after an operation. As the issue or injury resolves, the pain resolves as well. On the other hand, chronic pain is ongoing, long-term pain that persists months or even years sometimes. An example of chronic pain would be a permanently injured back in which the patient has ongoing back pain for 10 years. Chronic conditions that don't resolve can often correlate with chronic pain that lasts as well. Whether a patient's pain is chronic or acute, nurses must regularly assess a patient's pain when taking their vital signs by both asking questions and observing behaviors. Asking the patient questions allows the nurse to gather subjective data to understand what the patient is feeling, whereas observing the patient's pain characteristics helps her gather objective data that is visible and can be seen. What exactly should a nurse ask when assessing pain? You will want to ask about the patient's perception of their pain, which to the appropriate level will include knowing its severity, location, onset, and progression, quality, what relieves or aggravates it, any limitation the pain causes, and any symptoms that accompany the pain. There is no need to necessarily memorize these, as practically you probably will not ask every one of these questions every time you assess pain, but depending on the situation, you do want to be aware of these questions so you are ready to get as much information as the situation warrants. Let's take a minute and talk about each of these categories. First, there is pain severity. When discussing severity of pain, we are talking about finding out how bad a patient's pain is, according to them. To discover this, you will want to use a pain scale. There are a variety of pain scales that can be used to assess a patient's pain level, some of which are geared more toward adult patients, or at least older children around 8 and above, and some toward pediatric patients who are younger. Though there are many scales, there are a few that are most commonly seen. The first pain scale very commonly used for adult patients is a numeric pain scale in which a patient states a number between 0 and 10. A 0 means a patient is having no pain. A 1 to 3 usually means the patient is having mild pain. A 4 to 6 means moderate pain. And a 7 to 10 means severe pain. These are the general contours, but make sure you know the protocols for your own facility in terms of what numbers constitute mild, moderate, and severe pain on the numeric pain scale. A second type of pain scale used commonly for adults is a descriptive pain scale in which the patient describes their pain using words like no pain, mild pain, moderate pain, severe pain, or the worst possible pain, for instance. A third type of pain scale is a visual analog scale in which the patient can mark their level of pain somewhere on the scale ranging from no pain to the worst possible pain. Next is a pain scale used for pediatric patients called the FACES pain scale. It was created by two women whose last names were Wong and Baker, so you will also hear it called the Wong-Baker scale. With this scale, a child points to the face that best represents how bad their pain is. This scale is commonly used for children that are in preschool or above. For infants and toddlers or for any patient unable to verbalize their pain level, the FLAC scale is a good choice. With this scale, the nurse assesses the patient in five areas, 
facial expression, leg position, activity, cry, and consolability. The nurse will give a rating of 0, 1, or 2 to each area, and then the individual scores are tallied to give an overall pain level that correlates with mild, moderate, or severe pain. The CRIES pain scale is used for newborns, and it is an acronym that stands for five areas that are assessed. Crying, requiring oxygen, increased vital signs, expressions, and sleeplessness. Each category is given a rating of 0, 1, or 2, and the scores are tallied to give an overall picture of the newborn's pain level. As a nurse, knowing your patient's pain severity helps you better know what type of ordered PRN pain medication would be most appropriate for the situation. For instance, if a patient has a pain of 2, acetaminophen would probably be more appropriate, whereas if their pain was a 9, oxycodone would possibly be more appropriate. The second question a nurse should ask about is the location of the patient's pain. This is a very important question that can easily go overlooked due to assumptions. For instance, you assume when the patient states his pain is 7 out of 10 that he is talking about his wrist, since he is in the emergency room for a wrist fracture, but later you find out he was actually talking about his back, back pain, from lying all night on the emergency room stretcher. Case in point, never make assumptions, rather ask and clarify. A third question to ask relates to the patient's pain in regards to onset and progression. Did the pain start today, three weeks ago? or five years ago? Has the pain gotten worse, stayed about the same, or gotten better? Is it a constant pain, or does it come and go? A fourth question to ask is about the quality of the pain the patient is experiencing. Ask your patient, what does their pain feel like? They might say something like sharp, dull, throbbing, stabbing, aching, or radiating, for instance. A fifth question to ask is about relief and aggravation of the pain. Is there anything that relieves or lessens the pain? Is there anything that you found that aggravates the pain or makes it worse? A sixth question to ask about is limitations the pain causes. Does the pain limit any movements or activities for the patient? A seventh question to ask is if the pain is accompanied with any other unwanted symptoms, such as headache or nausea, for instance. In review, these are the types of questions you want to ask regarding a patient's perception of their pain. However, we don't want to just ask about their pain. We also want to observe any pain characteristics and behaviors, such as vital sign indicators, vocalizations, expressions, movements, and interactions and activities. So let's talk a little about each of these. First, you will want to observe your patient's vital signs. For acute pain, and note this is for acute, not chronic pain, you will often see an increase in heart rate, systolic blood pressure, and respirations. If the issue causing an increase in vital signs is due to pain, once a patient has given pain medication to relieve that pain, their vital signs will often return back to their baseline. A second observation you will want to make is observing the patient's vocalizations. Observe if the patient is moaning, crying, asking for relief, saying something hurts. Take note of these vocalizations so you can act in the best interest of your patient. A third observation to note is the patient's facial expressions. Are they grimacing or wincing? Are they smiling or laughing? A fourth observation relates to the patient's movements. Note if your patient is restless, tense, or holding a part of their body that is hurting, for instance. Fifth, you will want to observe the patient's interactions and activities. Perhaps they are avoiding conversation, trying to distract themselves with an activity, or having difficulty concentrating when you are talking to them. In summary, ask and observe your patient when you regularly assess their pain. Next, let's talk about treatments for pain. Treatment falls into two general categories, drug treatments and non-drug treatments. The goal of these treatments is to decrease and hopefully eliminate the patient's pain while also discovering and addressing the root cause of their pain so they can have ongoing relief moving forward if at all possible. Drug treatments for pain include non-opioids like acetaminophen or ibuprofen, opioids like oxycodone, steroids like dexamethasone, muscle relaxers like cyclobenzaprine, also called Flexril, or neuropathic pain medications like gabapentin. Non-drug treatments for pain include hot and cold therapy, acupuncture, chiropractic adjustments, massage, TENS, which uses a mild electric current to alleviate pain, distraction, deep breathing, and exercise or PT, which is physical therapy. Whether the treatment the doctor orders is a drug or non-drug treatment, remember to reassess a patient's pain level after any intervention for pain. 
your facility will often have a protocol for how quickly you should reassess pain after certain treatments, especially drug treatments, so make sure you're aware of this. Remember the situation with Sally? Based on Sally's story and current vital signs, what drug treatment will the doctor likely prescribe Sally? Is the answer A, oxycodone, B, gabapentin, C, ibuprofen, or D, ice or heat? If you said C, you are correct. Since Sally's pain is mild, a 3 out of 10, and her vital signs are not anything crazy, and her facial expression is positive, the doctor will likely prescribe ibuprofen for a few days to help with the inflammation and pain Sally is experiencing after the seatbelt hit her ribs during that fender bender. Thanks for being part of the Capsule RN community. If this video added value to your studies, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. We are excited about releasing more and more content in our continued pursuit of making nursing school easier.